Hi, my name is Hannah Strauss. I'm the creator of Joe Plant Comics. My website is joeplant2021.com or you can see Joe Plant Comics on globalcomics.com. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today with another talented and creative person. So who is our guest today? Our guest today is a very talented comic creator and writer and author of a, a fun, uh, not only educational, but hilarious comic. We are joined today by the ever-talented Hannah Strauss, creator of Joe Plant. How are you doing today? I'm well, thank you, and thanks for having me on. It's good to have you on. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I used to work in the uh, TV and animation industry and film as a storyboard artist. I decided during the COVID-19 epidemic, during lockdown, that I was getting bored and I decided to revive my abilities to entertain myself and to be creative. So I came up with the character Joe Plant. It started as a feature size screenplay, about 100 pages, and I decided to divvy it up and turn it into a comic book series. So my experience is primarily from working in uh, TV animation during the 1980s. Uh, I worked at Filmation Studios. I worked on Captain Planet and the Planeteers. I remember that well. <laughs> <laughs> Shira, Princess of Power, Ghostbusters, oh, wow. I, and Brave Star. I worked on all of those. And I worked on a few comedic films. Beverly Hills Ninja, I oh, worked nice. on that. And I worked on, uh, oh, I worked on The Crow, although that wasn't a comedy. No, but a good film. <laughs> <laughs> it was all a great experience to me. And I did that for about 25 years. And I always had also an interest in biology and ecology and zoology. So I decided to take a break from uh, media and entertainment and uh, pursue a career for 10 years as a biological technician. So that's another facet of my source of creativity, which I employed in to to developing the Joe Plan character. We have so much we can touch on in just such a limited <laughs> amount of time, unfortunately, which means I have to have you back on, you know, for, oh, sure. Interview, for sure. <laughs> Let's talk about Joe Plant comic, because I love the fact that you combined your love of botany and provided a bit of an education as well too, but you also provided some wonderful humor as well. So you have a great style that I think a lot of people will enjoy. What is the most misunderstood aspect about being an educator in biology for those that read this? This type of comic? Well, probably a lot of them think we don't have a great sense of humor. Maybe our humor is too dry and nerdy or whatever. <laughs> Since I did work in the entertainment industry around very creative and funny people, that can't help but have rubbed off on me. And I wanted to put that into the Joe Plant character to make him relatable to as many people as possible in order to uh, make the subject matter more appealing and get my point across. So then what challenges did you face when you started creating this comic that maybe newer people in the comic industry could learn from? Taking the script and, well, it wasn't really that difficult for me because I worked as a storyboard artist and I was used to working from scripts. Mm -hmm. I always had to create the visuals to go along with the dialogue and the action that was described in the screenplay. So adapting it into a comic wasn't all that difficult, although there were different parameters I had to follow, formatting it for a comic that might be different than for a film or TV storyboard. I edited out some action or dialogue that I thought might be too boring and draw it out too long. And I added like more comedy and slapstick and gags to make it more visually appealing. I always love the fact that when we have creative people on the show that they're an artist and a writer, they do everything all together in one. So everything relies on themselves. In terms of the creative process, what would you enjoy about putting this comic together? Well, it's almost like giving birth to your own child. I think a lot of creators will agree with me on that aspect of it. So you're sort of molding this personality. You actually start to sort of bond emotionally with the character too, which I think lends itself to a more personal touch and make it more relatable 
to people. Of course, your time in the entertainment industry and your time uh, in, in biology and, and botany as well as added to your experiences in creating this, I'm sure. Sure. You know, I, I decided to take the knowledge that I acquired and make it more digestible to a, a general audience. You know, I said, oh, botany, uh, I'm going to take these biology classes in college. <laughs> Couldn't. So I didn't want to take that approach. But also, I had a lot of experience doing educational art outreach and interpretive programs, working for the Park Service and for a couple of nature preserves. So that came into play, too, to being able to relate to an audience. And that's what I noticed about your social media presence as well, too. You're still educating and still providing interesting tidbits of knowledge that I don't think a lot of people understand, which right. you're like the Steve Irwin of botany. <laughs> Hardly, no, nah, nah. Botany is not actually my specialty. I'm more of a generalist. There are a lot more fun people out there that are specialists in botany than I am. Actually, my knowledge of botany is very generalized as compared to people who specialize in it. And there are plenty of other people that are YouTubers or whatever out there that do a far better way of presenting that information than I do. <laughs> Well, I enjoy what you're putting out there. So, you know, oh, thank you. So for me, there was a, and this is a quick segue story for me. I, I really enjoyed um, the sciences and computers and all this other stuff. So right. I was very fortunate to have a, a wonderful biology teacher named uh, Mr. Spinks who unfortunately passed away, but he gave me my love of, uh, of perennials and my love of uh, plant life. And, and he just had a, a wonderful, uh, persona about him to share and educate. And I'm glad I'm seeing, I'm seeing very similar aspects of what he taught with what you're creating in, in not only the comic, but also with your social media too. Yeah. I think we're beginning to understand now that uh, the botany kingdom is a lot more complex than people give it credit for. Yeah. They're far more complex organisms than uh, we may realize in everyday life because you know, we walk by them and not notice them. They're kind of static. You know, they don't really move much in front of our eyes. So we don't pay much attention to them. There's a deep well of knowledge and information we're uh, tapping now on how complex the lives of plants really are. So I try to incorporate that now in um, issue two of Joe Plant Comics, no, in issue three, excuse me, oh. issue three, which is called Adaptations, where Joe Plant is learning how to deal with his new persona and as being part plant. Issue one is free on Global Comics. They're all free. <laughs> Every one of them is free. Yeah. Why Global Comics and why you wanted to post there for Joe Plant? Global Comics is a great platform for indie creators to showcase their work. The people who have created the platform have really gone out of their way to make a very special site that helps creators, indie creators especially, who want to expose their work and share their work with the world. And they're always coming up with new things they incorporate into the site where you can monetize it and present it and all types of uh, new add-ons that they're creating. And I highly recommend it to other creators if they would like to have another showcase for their their work. There's a lot of great content there as well, too. And, and we never have enough time in the day to read everything. Oh, that yeah. We want it's, it's, yeah. I'm glad that a lot of creators are finding that platform now and using it. It's just another outlet for them to be able to expose their work. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh, my God. The minute I opened my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> what you say, <laughs> you know, that whole thing, the pen is not mightier than the sword. Oh, my goodness. You, <laughs> you learn sometimes what to say and what not to say. <laughs> no question. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice that you've received in your career? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that has stuck with you in your journey as a creative person? Let's see, given like bits of advice from Will Eisner and philosophy teachers, don't overthink things because that's when you get into trouble. You might come up with suddenly a concept of, or an idea that's really fresh and just write it down. 
Um, Because sometimes when you start to dissect it and pull it apart in an attempt to make it better or refine it, you actually ruin it. So sometimes you just have to go with your gut and just take it from there. That's pretty much the way that I work. How have you been able to accomplish that in your own careers? Let's say I was working out a scene in a film and storyboarding it. I'll do different iterations of it. Then they find out the director says, well, I like that one. And that's that's the first one that I went with. (laughs) So that's one way you find out about it. Yeah. What is the most enjoyable thing about being a creative person? I find that I can entertain myself for long periods of time without always needing to have somebody around me. I've never had a problem with doing that. When I was a little kid, I would spend hours like just drawing my own comics and creating my own character. You know, I had the ability to create, to express my creativity in a uh, solid way. All my thoughts, processes, I was able to put down on paper, give them their own reality. That's always been with me since I was a kid. I'm going to pull a question for Barbara Walters, who unfortunately <laughs> passed away recently. What kind of tree do you see? Is that the one? That, that was the one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What kind of tree? I don't know. (laughs) I think I'm more of something. I see myself as something more weedy or something. (laughs) I was going to say maybe a perennial. You're 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 constantly perennial. Yeah, well, there are perennial weedy things too. (laughs) I don't know. Or maybe some kind of horrible bog plant that you know that needs methane in order to grow. Like you know. <laughs> like a Venus flytrap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. See, not many people would understand the question I was going for when one mentions Berber Walters. You'd have to be around in the 80s and 90s to really yeah, understand. Yeah, some that. of these people there, they said, who's Barbara Walters? <laughs> one of the best, probably one of the best interviews, I think, of, of the, the many decades in the past, for sure. Yeah, she she will be missed. That's for sure. I this can be for writing and art. What was the first thing that you created that made you realize, yes, I could do this as a career? I had a character as a kid called Nutty Dinosaur, and that came out of my love of dinosaurs as a little girl. Whereas like a lot of girls, when I was growing up in my age, most of them collected dolls. I collected plastic dinosaurs. I had a whole bag full of plastic dinosaurs that I dragged with, with me wherever I would go. That was one of my first characters I created as a kid. I did my own comic book with Nutty the Dinosaur, who was a T-Rex who acted like a person and wore clothing. So that's when I decided. And I was actually encouraged by my family. Oh, you know, maybe you'd like to you'd be interested in pursuing a career in art. So and I also used to write my own stories, all kinds of animals with their lives and stuff like that. So I was definitely encouraged by my family to pursue that. But I still also had that interest in the na- interest in the natural world too. So that always hung around there as well. How has entertainment changed from a creative perspective from the 80s, 90s, and to today? Oh, you know, I've been out of it for so long. I can only speak for myself up to like the year 2000 when I decided to change my career. I don't know what to say. I don't have much experience recently in what's going on other than, you know, occasionally I go see a movie or watch a TV show. I guess inclusion. I think that's a good thing that there's more inclusion with all types of people out there. There's not just one cookie cutter mold out there. I think inclusion is a is a great thing. And uh, I think there needs to be talent coming from all aspects and all different sources, you know, from all cultures and stuff. I think that's great that we're incorporating that now, all kinds of uh, inclusion. There isn't just one type of person out there. And I think uh, the shows that are coming out that have inclusion in them, you know, is is a good thing. The only thing I have to say, though, in certain situations, let's say a TV show, a cartoon show, I won't mention the name here now, that has a very loyal fan base based on the characters that were developed when I was there at the studio. And they try to revive this show on a, and I, on a streaming platform and changed it. I think that disappointed a lot of uh, loyal fans because of there was too many changes in the characters. Mm. And you have to be very careful when you do something like that because you can lose an audience. You have to, I think, maintain some of the integrity of the, in the um, recognizable aspects of the character. I think it's, it's sort of, uh, you know, you're sort of denying the original fan base there if you go too far and make too many changes in the characters. 
So I think if you stray away from that too much, then you start to lose an audience. You may try to, it may be an attempt to gain a different audience, but you have to make some attempt to uh, keep the original audience there too, the original fans. I think the, uh, the creators of the show, I think, have some kind of obligation to try to do that in a, a uh, diplomatic way. What is the hardest part about being a creative person? Is it the beginning, the middle, or the end of your process? I guess refining and finishing the final artwork, because you want it to look like you want it to be perfect. Sometimes it doesn't always come out the way you were hoping it would. And you say, ah, I could have done better. But that may be just because I'm very critical. <laughs> I don't think you would be a creative person if you weren't critical of your right, own work. Right. You, know, you finish the page and you step back and you look at it. You know, I, I could have done a better job on that. Are you still a traditional artist or have you gone to the digital? I am traditional, do it traditionally, but I scan it and I digitize it and I'll retouch it later on. But no, I haven't made that leap yet to like Clip Studio Paint or Procreate or anything like that. Maybe if I sell Joe Plant, then I'll invest into a whole digital thing and do it that way. And because it's going to be a big learning curve for me to uh, get comfortable with the new tools, because that's all they are. They're just basically a new set of tools and you have to learn how to use them. For those that don't know anything about Will Eisner and, and Harvey Keisman, what was what were your experiences with them as as a creative person? Uh, Will Eisner, I learned a lot about uh, continuity and storytelling with him. Uh, one of the uh, concepts that he tried to emphasize to his students is that the reader should be able to understand what's going on on a page that's been laid out without really having to have a lot of words or dialogue or anything. They should be, your, your, your visuals should be effective enough that uh, it's very easy to understand what's going on conceptually on the page. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what I took, back, took from him. And as far as Harvey Kurtzman, well, the humor thing again, his whole class is all about, you know, humor and comics and stuff like that. You know, my fellow students in that class, I mean, some of them, I, a lot of jokers in there. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to have a sense of humor, though, when you're a creative person, because you're so focused on the task at hand that sometimes yeah. you can lose yourself in the process. Yeah, yeah, it does help to have a sense of humor. You know, don't take everything too seriously, you know, about what you're doing. Like a lot of that stuff that I'll read, like on, you know, on different media platforms, you know, the doom scrolling, I'll try to give a humorous twist to it. I admit I'm a doom scroller, but it generally has to do with uh, environmental issues. So, I mean, it is a serious topic, but I try to employ some humor in there so people don't think me some kind of Debbie Downer and get into a funk about it. What are some environmental situations that we should really be turning our lives around for? Oh, gosh, there are so many of them. Where do I begin? I think one of the tops is consumerism. Consumerism creates a lot of waste. I think a lot of people aren't aware of a lot of the stuff that we throw away and we don't use there's no place to put it. It just starts piling up. It's being piled up in other countries and poor countries. It's being dumped into the ocean. Just have to learn, I think, to live with a lot of, without a lot of stuff, I think would be very helpful to the planet if we could. Humans make a lot of waste. And, you know, a lot of the major corporations around the world, they're not that environmentally friendly as they try to come across. They just substitute one thing for another. You know, they're not necessarily making any kind of concessions that would make a, a major difference in treating the planet in a better way. Just about your creative process as a person. And there are no wrong answers. So it is what it is. It's, it's your own introspective nature. I like to read a lot, a lot of factual material more so than fictional. You know, a lot of research has a great influence on my creative process. I figured the more knowledgeable you are as a creator, the more creative you can be. I don't know. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Then you have a, a knowledge base to tap from in order to create something wonderful for other people to enjoy and to share with them and to put a message out there that they can understand and appreciate. 
I'm always like into reading like research papers on biology or latest findings and, you know, in ecology and stuff. That's always helped me a lot. And it's good experience to pull from as well, too. I had an interview with Jill Thompson uh, and I asked her what what makes a good artist? And she said, well, from my experience, uh, I was always told not to say no to anything so that she would gain experience in uh, in, in art in any different area. Yeah, I agree with that. The more open-minded you are in learning different aspects of subjects and topics in life, the more you can feed your creativity. I think the more well-rounded you are in terms of knowledge, it'll be more helpful to your creativity. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Well, probably the one person that motivated me the most to pursue my creative career was a junior high school art teacher. She was, I don't remember her name. She was a very kind woman, and she was the one that encouraged me to take a test to get into a specialized high school for artistic uh, students. And I think she was the one that really helped to trigger, trigger and jumpstart my career. From a professional standpoint, you've had a, a wonderful batch of careers in entertainment, in biology, and of course now comic creation as well too. And you've created now three issues of Joe Plant, so the congratulations on doing that. And Thanks. so you are professionally successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yeah, I think so. I think uh, looking back now, I'm 67 years old, which I'm not afraid to say. And I think I've accomplished quite a bit in my life. I'm always looking forward to doing more and trying other things as well. It's not the end of my life, but looking back, I think I've accomplished a lot and I have no regrets in the paths that I've decided to take. I'm very happy with what I've done so far. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failure? Well, I notice as you get older, you're more accepting of it because you're more aware of your weaknesses and you learn to accept those and your vulnerabilities and the fact that you're human. You're not going to be successful at everything. When you're younger, it's really hard to deal with that, with rejection. But as you get older, you know, with wisdom, you don't get riled up about it as much anymore because you begin to accept the fact that you're a human with strengths and weaknesses. And with every failure, there can always be a success. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a person in entertainment, in comics, in botany, or biology, who knows what they may aspire to be creatively in the future. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? By not being afraid to share your ideas and opinions and reaching out to them. Engagement. There's lots of ways you can do engagement, like doing interviews like this and sharing your information and knowledge. If they have questions, being open to answering those questions to the best of your ability and giving them information if they ask for it. So that's the approach that I usually take. If your life was a film, TV series, or comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. That's one. What would, what would it be? I don't know. My Misadventures. <laughs> I don't know. Soundtrack? Yeah. Probably the one from Rain Man. Oh, that was a good one. Mm hmm that was very the Zimmer, good. yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, classic. Yeah, mm -hmm. Yeah, I have that in my collection. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, Hannah, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, well, thank you for having me. I just wanted to let everybody know that Joe Plant Issue 2 and Joe Plant Issue 3, which is in progress right now, are available free to view at Global Comics. Dot com, or if you want to read issue one, which is Joe Plant's Amazing Adventures in the Amazon Rainforest, you can read it at JoePlant2021.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Hannah, for that. I You're really well. appreciate it. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. And of course, on our YouTube channel, 
which is a lot more updated than our website. Give me a break. I'm only one person, which is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT media. And our podcast is back after 14 years, which is on to geeks talking dot podbean dot com. I didn't think about that for a second. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, the first hundred episodes, at least of 2022. And I will be slowly uploading all of the thousand plus others from the past 15 years on the show. So, as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on to Geek Stalking. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome.